Hey everyone. So, surprise, it's me. Uh, just wanted to uh, give you a quick prep for our discussion on the antihistamines. I want to spend a little bit of time going through uh, some of the physiology that we already know about histamine and uh, the things that it does. So then our discussion on the antihistamines will make a lot more sense. So, uh, so what is histamine then? Uh, generally, uh, we think of histamine as a chemical messenger. It's released by cells in certain situations and then acts upon other types of tissue based on what receptors are in play. That's what we're going to talk about today. So it mediates several cellular responses, including inflammatory reactions, allergic reactions. Uh, if you remember back to biomedical science when we were talking about um, gastric acid secretion, uh, it, uh, histamine plays a role. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then there's histamine also acts as a, a neurotransmitter in the brain, although it's very limited. Um, in in the oh, just got a text message. I apologize. So uh, <clears throat> we know that it works there in the brain, but it's very limited in what it does. It likely plays a role in keeping you awake. And so when some, that's the reason that some antihistamines can actually make you a little sleepy because if you block the histamine receptors uh, where that histamine neurotransmitter is working, it, it actually leads to a little bit of sleepiness. So uh, we're not going to be too overly concerned with that though. So histamine uh, is, is really widely present through really all tissue types, basically. Uh, the receptors for histamine are also found really throughout the body, but especially in high concentrations in certain tissues. So the highest concentration of histamine receptors are found on cells in the lungs, skin, blood vessels, and the GI tract. Okay, so if you think about that, then you might think, well, if there's a lot of histamine being released, it, it's mostly going to affect these organs or structures. And we'll, we'll talk about the effect of histamine. Okay, so uh, histamine has also been isolated from the venom of several poisonous or venomous uh, animals, include animals or, or insects, including like rattlesnakes. Uh, so that would explain a lot of the reaction from those bites or stings. It's actually related to a histamine response. And then, uh, as you already know, this isn't a big surprise, but histamine is one of those very important mediators that's released by cells in response to noxious stimuli. So if you get cut or stung by a bee or something like that, the tissue injury is going to cause those mast cells to release histamine. So like we, we've already talked about in the past, histamine is stored within mast cells in granules. And the fact that it's stored in granules is very important. That granule is actually protecting the histamine because if histamine is free to float through a cell or free to float through plasma, uh, it actually gets degraded very quickly. And so in order for it to have any effect, uh, that effect has to be rapid before it gets degraded. And uh, that's why it's stored inside those granules inside the cell, because if it wasn't in those granules, it'd be, it would be degraded quickly. So histamine then can be released from the mast cells when exposed to uh, any number of uh, stimulants, and it can be cold, heat, toxins, uh, including like microbial organisms and their toxins, uh, even uh, being bound by IgE as, a, as an antibody will trigger mast cells to release the, the histamine. Uh, venom, like we already talked about, and then trauma can result in release of histamine from the, the mast cells. And so when we get this allergic reaction, this IgE type uh, antibody can bind to and activate those histamine producing cells, uh, which is explains a lot of the symptoms you see with allergic reaction and anaphylaxis. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So throughout the body then on various cell types, there are histamine receptors. And these receptors then when histamine is released from the mast cell will bind to that receptor. And because it's binding that receptor underneath in the cell, it triggers a whole uh, chain of events that results in some time of, some type of a tissue response. We'll talk about those tissue responses. But as you can see here in the picture, we have the uh, an antihistamine essentially then is blocking that receptor so that when histamine comes floating in, it can't actually bind to the receptor. 
Okay. Now there are actually four main types of H or histamine receptors. We've got H1, H2, H3, and H4. H3 and H4 are less of a concern for us clinically. The ones that are mostly clinically applicable are H1 and H2. So we're going to focus our discussion on H1 and H2. So when histamine binds to H1 or H2 receptors, uh, various effects are possible, and the effect is really dependent on what type of tissue that receptor is found in. So let's talk about that. So the histamine actions, when histamine is released and binds to its receptor. So first of all, let's talk about the H1 receptors. Okay, H1, let's talk about peripheral sensory neurons. So these peripheral sensory and pain and, and uh, other sensory neurons that are out there in the tissue, if histamine is released, Histamine can come and bind to an H1 receptor on those peripheral neurons and can cause symptoms like itchiness and sometimes even pain. Uh, intestinal smooth muscle cells also have a high degree or a high concentration of H1 receptors. So when histamine is released, it can cause constriction and cramping of the stomach. That's why some people have, or, or the intestines, that's why some people who have a pretty significant uh, allergic reaction can have stomach pain as well. Um, secretory mucosa, and so specifically here we're talking about like the, the nasal passages and the bronchial airways. When histamine is released, it actually, when it binds to H1 receptors in those areas, it can trigger uh, rhinorrhea, maybe a cough because of excess mucus production, but you get a lot of excess production. So when you have allergic reactions or seasonal allergies, a lot of the reaction that you're having there with increased production from the nose that's coming because of histamine release uh, in that tissue. And then you get uh, in pulmonary smooth muscle in those bronchioles uh, can cause constriction. So if histamine is released, it can bite down on those bronchioles and lead to shortness of breath. So that's especially uh, problematic in conditions like anaphylaxis, which is what you'll find out here in a minute, just a very widespread and rapid histamine release. And it'll cause those bronchioles to constrict down and, and cause shortness of breath. So now some t uh, there, are recept there are some types of tissue that have both H1 and H2 receptors. So when histamine binds there, uh, it, it can have certain effects. And so first of all, cardiovascular. H1 and H2 receptors found throughout the cardiovascular system when they're bound uh, can result in dropping of blood pressure because of widespread vasodilation of the arterioles. Okay. And then the pre-capillary sphincters also relax, pushing a lot of that blood into the capillary system, which decreases the peripheral vascular resistance. And because of that, blood pressure drops. Okay. And then uh, you also are going, because of that release with the vasodilation, you get kind of a paradoxical or a, a response uh, by increasing the heart rate and not only do you get that response from the body to increase heart rate when the blood pressure drops, but histamine itself can actually act directly on the heart to increase the ionotropic and chronotropic, which means basically the strength of contraction and the speed of contraction, uh, which results in that reflex tachycardia to the decreasing blood pressure. Okay. And then dermatologic, so in the skin, uh, when histamine binds an H1 and H2 receptors in the skin, you get what we refer to as the triple response. We're going to talk about that on the next slide, but basically it results in the skin, it results in vasodilation with increased permeability, and that leaks fluid and proteins in the into the tissue so you can get swelling and, and wheels, which are hives like this. So here's a, a pretty good picture of some hives and uh, what we would call wheels. So the triple response, which is histamine's response in the skin, is reddening of the, reddening of the skin initially. Okay, So it initially gets red. And then you get this wheel formation as those capillaries are vasodilating and allowing a lot of the fluid in. So you have increased capillary permeability. So a lot of that fluid pushes into the tissue and results in that wheel or that hive. And then you get an irregular halo flare, which let me pull out my arrow. That's just talking about this widespread redness that uh, is around the hive. Initially, the reddening of the skin is right there where the hive would start. And then you get this uh, 
wheel that forms and then all of a sudden you get this flare of reddening around the skin and then halo forms notice how it looks like a halo okay and so that, those are the physiologic mechanisms that explain that hopefully that makes a lot of sense so now let's talk about just H2 receptors then. When H2 receptors are bound by histamine, uh, these are mostly found in the gastric areas or in the, in the stomach itself. And if you remember back to biomedical science when we were talking about secretory function of the, of the intestinal, the gastrointestinal system, you might remember those enterochromaffin-like cells or the ECL cells that are found really near to parietal cells and when gastrin acts on those or if there's just a widespread release of histamine histamine binding to a parietal cell is going to activate the parietal cell to release a lot more uh, of the acid so you get a lot more hydrochloric acid production with histamine present so with a lot of histamine a lot you get a lot of gastric acid and that's why you can sometimes get gastric ulcers as a result. And so one of our treatments for uh, these peptic ulcers are actually what we would call H2 blockers. And we'll talk about that uh, during our antihistamine pharmacology discussion. So I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about anaphylaxis. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, symptoms of anaphylaxis uh, obviously are swelling and difficulty breathing, and it relates uh, allergic reaction and anaphylaxis both seem to be related to this release of inflammatory mediators, especially histamine. So when histamine is released meaning it's no longer bound inside those granules, it's free to spread, it rapidly it's rapidly degraded and inactivated. But if histamine, the histamine release is just out of control and all tissue throughout the body is having this massive allergic reaction to something. So a good example would be like peanuts. If a person has a severe allergy to peanuts, when they eat peanuts, their immune system goes haywire and all those IgE and other antibodies present throughout the body that are against that peanut <coughs> are going to trigger all of these mast cells throughout the body to release histamine. So you get this rapid and aggressive release of histamine all over the body. And so because it's everywhere, you get uh, the degradation of that histamine doesn't happen as fast as it normally would, and it can lead to anaphylaxis. So uh, what's happening during an anaphylactic reaction? Histamine is binding histamine receptors everywhere, and it can result in swelling. I mean, look at this, this poor gal, uh, with the swelling around the eyes, the swelling in the face, the swelling in the lips, and you can get swelling all over the body. You can get hives all over the body. And remember the, the reaction that you can get inside the lungs with histamine binding is that bronchoconstriction, and then you get vasodilation as well. So with, with that vasodilation, if it's severe and you develop hypotension, we would call that a form of histamine shock which is extremely life-threatening and those are the people uh, that likely might not make it so how do we treat this anaphylaxis then epinephrine <laughs> okay so uh, anaphylaxis our first line treatment is epinephrine giving giving them an epinephrine injection um, it acts quickly and and you might think to yourself well does that actually treat the histamine binding no it doesn't what we're doing is with the epinephrine, we're doing the exact opposite to the lungs and the blood vessels that histamine did. So epinephrine is going to cause vasoconstriction, which is going to bring the blood pressure back up, and it's going to cause bronchodilation. So we're counteracting the effects of that widespread histamine release and giving the body time to degrade all of that histamine. So an antihistamine in the treatment of anaphylaxis is second line. We usually only throw on an antihistamine uh, when we need it, when the epinephrine's not doing the job fully. But we'll talk about that more. Um, that brings us to the end of this discussion. It ended up being longer, 15 minutes, a little longer than I wanted it to be. But um, I hope this all made sense. A lot of it I know was review. And so um, I feel like this is the best kind of prep that we could do. I couldn't find anything good out there on the internet uh, for me to share with you for class prep. So I decided to just make my own. So um, hopefully this was helpful. We'll do a, a fun quiz uh, in a different format that you guys haven't seen yet, which I hope you'll enjoy. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you in class. Thanks.